Hello, this is saxophonist Antonio Parker, and this is a conversation in jazz, where we are promoting jazz and telling the stories. Our guest today is the wonderful jazz vocalist, educator, composer, and arranger, Mrs. Jessica Boykin Settles. We ask you to like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell icon so we can let you know when we are posting another video or going live. We also ask you to donate to our Cash App in order to support the channel and help us to produce future videos. Our Cash App is dollar sign Jazzology 101. That's dollar sign Jazzology 101. Enjoy the video. Hi, I'm saxophonist Antonio Parker, and this is A Conversation in Jazz. Today, we have a wonderful jazz vocalist, educator, composer, arranger, and jazz historian. She has served as a professor of jazz voice at Howard University and currently teaches history and music theory at Georgetown University. She is a regular presenter at the annual Washington Women in Jazz Festival. Please welcome my sister, the lovely Miss Jessica Boykin Settled. Jessica, how you doing? I'm well. I'm so happy to be here. Oh, welcome to a conversation in jazz. And this is laid back. Okay. You know, so just relax and just. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so nervous. I feel like I this is a, a big deal. Yeah. But we were just talking about when we met. And so, and you are married to one of the. Uh, Superstar jazz saxophonist, <laughs> tenor saxophonist on the scene today, Mr. Brian Settle. So, and uh, and y'all go back to high school, right? Mm -hmm. And we're gonna talk about that. <laughs> okay. But I think we met y'all. You had you said you had because I knew Brian when he was in high school when he played alto saxophone, mm -hmm. and then he went away for a minute and came back. Mm -hmm. I didn't know where he had gone, but and I think that I met you. When doing we came that, back. yeah, yeah, on that, around that time. Mm -hmm. I think you were at how in grad school, mm -hmm. okay, yeah, so that's that's probably where we met, yeah. So, anyway, this is a conversation in jazz, and we get to know we want to know s some of your background and how you got to this point that you are at today, okay. all right. So, my first question is, who is Jessica Boykin Settle? <laughs> Um, well, today <laughs> I am, um, you know, a student of the music, yeah. a student of jazz, um, a sometimes teacher of jazz. Um, <clears throat> I'm, uh, you know, all those things you said in your opening, of, <laughs> yeah. you know, I love to compose, I love to arrange, yeah. um, you know, I sing. Uh, I'm a wife, as uh, you also said. I'm a dog mom. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, you know, I have a lot of different interests. I have a very eclectic music tastes. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I love nature and, you yeah. know, all things beautiful. Yeah. yeah. You and Brian seem perfect for each other because y'all so, y'all seem laid back. <laughs> Just cool. You've always been cool, calm, and collective. <laughs> Beautiful personalities, you know. Um, Thank so you. we're gonna talk about that a little later. Okay. Okay. Now, where are you originally from? I'm originally from Washington D.C. Oh yeah. Born and born and raised. What part of D.C.? Uh, I guess like Lee Joy Park. Is that northeast? Uh, well, I lived on the northwest side of North Capitol Street, so North Capitol. Okay. Separates the east and west okay. sides gotcha, of gotcha, DC. Gotcha. So I grew up on the west, northwest side of North Capitol Street near Howard University. Okay. <clears throat> and what was it like coming up in DC when you were coming up? Oh man. Well, you know, Go Go was king. Yeah. <laughs> um. Now was DC the? I remember DC when I got. I came to DC in like '87. Okay. You were around in that time, right? Mm -hmm. Do you remember D.C. at that time? Mm-hmm. Um, 
I remember that time we was we didn't. It was campus to the dorm. <laughs> DC was uh, rough back then. Yeah, but you know, I, I had this conversation with um, you know a lot of people ask me about that when they find out that I'm from DC. Yeah, they're uh -huh. like, oh, how yeah. was it during that? You know that time uh -huh. during the crack epidemic yeah. and and you know we were told to stay away from certain areas, mm -hmm. you know, as as kids. But my parents. Um, they used to own a carryout wow. on 14th Street. Mm. 14th Street, right below U Street, and 14th and U. Yeah. That yeah. was kind of yeah. <laughs> it was yeah, it, was, it rough. was rough. Yeah. You know, and but my parents weren't um they weren't really precious with us. You know, we could still you know, go out and explore and you know, go out to the movies and go. It was just like you know, you know where not to go. Yeah. You know what time to be home mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. But even though we knew things were happening, you know, I had friends. You know, once I got to high school, who had gotten kind of caught up. Okay. Um, wow. You know, and stuff. Um, but for the most part, I I still think I had a very normal mm -hmm. upbringing in the midst of a lot. You of, have siblings. Mm-hmm. Brothers and sisters? Uh-huh. I have an older sister. Okay. Um, my oldest, so I had two oldest, two older sisters. My oldest sister, uh, she passed when I was, uh, <clears throat> when I was 13. Wow. She was 11 years older, and then my sister was one year younger than her, so she's 10 years older than okay. me, and then I have a younger brother who's five years younger. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I'm kind of right. in the middle. Uh, got mm -hmm. you, <laughs> middle child. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did y'all did y'all have a musical family? So my dad um, played guitar and sang, self taught. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so, um, so my parents are not originally from D.C. They migrated here. My dad is originally from Bishopville, South Carolina. Okay, where we were shipped every summer gotcha. <laughs> to my grandma's house to you yeah. know to spend a few weeks in the summer. Um, and my mom has family in Bishopville. She and my dad met actually as children wow. in South Carolina, but she was raised in Baltimore. Yeah, um, so you got that southern, You got some of that southern hospitality in you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have uh, I have family in Alabama. Okay. And so my grandmother, my mom's mom, and she was from uh, Alabama, and, my, and her husband, Grandpa Parker, he was from Atlanta. Not not Atlanta, but Georgia. Um, I think Macon, Georgia. Mm -hmm. And so we got some of that. Even though I'm from Philly, mm -hmm. some of that Southern thing mm -hmm. through my grandma, the mm -hmm. values that are passed down, mm -hmm. came through my uh, my grandparents, Definitely. grandmother. Yeah, is it the same kind same, of thing. The very exact same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so my grandma, you know, and it's so interesting. Um, <clears throat> And thinking about my my grandmother, as I've been teaching this um, this jazz history course mm -hmm. uh, this past semester at Georgetown, you know we go back to um, field hollers and yeah. ring shouts and all that stuff, and I listen to a lot of those field recordings, those mm -hmm. Lomax field field recordings, and my grandmother would call me, like if I was out playing and she wanted me to come in, she would call me a certain way, and it was like. Jesse, woo, Jesse, woo. And wow. I never knew what that was, wow. right? But it was a field holler. Wow. You know, yeah, yeah. That's how she would. Yeah. And I never knew it then, but you know, as an adult now studying the music, I'm like, wow, that's yeah, that's really deep. Those connections are what we have to get to the, I think, this, the young generation, because they seem somewhat disconnected from those mm -hmm. values. Mm -hmm. And I think, like, and this is just my personal thing. I ain't going to get into my political thing. But, um, you know, we get into, we went to Black How University, Black, Black, Blackity, Black, Black. And I was the Blackity, Black cat. <laughs> but I, I've come to the conclusion over time that we have to focus more on our value system rather than just being, because being black can be different things now, mm -hmm. depending on what group. Mm -hmm. Where, you know, and so, but those values like that and those things, that's the thing I think that can help save 
us and move us forward, mm -hmm. you know. Because um, mm -hmm. that, you know, it was my value system that helped me to navigate through all this. Because I, I came up through that crack thing too, but it was my value system that was instilled by my mother, mm -hmm. f down from my grandmother, and, sh and we had a big mama. Mm -hmm. So we had a big mama in Alabama. So, and those values is where you knew, okay, number one, you ain't gonna embarrass the family. <laughs> You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think um, we that that's the things that we have to get to these young people. And you're an educator, and we're going to talk about that. I'm an educator. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's tough, you know, and we're going to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, we definitely knew, you know, that the last thing you wanted was to have a teacher oh my call God. my mama or my daddy. That's Ooh. the last thing <laughs> you wanted in the world. Yeah, oh, Lord. Uh-uh. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Now, you mentioned Go-Go. Uh, D.C. is known for Go-Go. Mm -hmm. Were you into Go-Go? I was into it as far as listening, but we were not allowed to go to the Go-Go. Okay, yeah, I understand. <laughs> so I didn't experience that until uh -huh. I was an adult. Yeah, you know? okay. But I listened um, to a lot. I mean, I love Chuck Brown. And, yeah. Yeah, I got Lil Benny. I was in D.C. for about 20 years before I even like really knew what Gogo was. Like mm -hmm. I was so into this jazz thing. And uh and I had I was I had gotten to producing and I had this track and I remember you know, I I knew Gogo was around but I just didn't check it out. And so I was I said, man, I wanna get Chuck Brown on this track <laughs> And at the time I didn't know who Chuck Brown I mean I knew I knew him from um um I feel like Bustin' Luke, cause we mm -hmm. we used to go skating on that and you know <laughs> I didn't know that was called Go Go. Uh -huh. I just saw that as a song, yeah. you know, that we loved. Yeah. And so I said, well, I knew Chuck Brown was performing at some club on New York Avenue. And I was playing at uh, HR 57 at times. So I said, and we got off, we finished at about 11, but the Go Go didn't start to mm -hmm. 1 or mm -hmm. something like that. <laughs> so I said, I'm going to go check out Chuck Brown mm -hmm. because I want to at least see him. And say, I, you yeah. know, so I went to check, see uh, Chuck, and here I see cats I knew, Brian Mills, Sweet Cherie, Greg Boyer, and, and I'm like, and I knew these, and I'm like, wow. And so I'm like, okay. And I'm just chilling, mm -hmm. enjoying, the, and, you know, just like, wow, this is cool. And so like a week later, Brian calls me and say, uh, Antonio, can you sub for, uh, uh, for me with Chuck Brown? And so I got to play, wow. and I traveled to Japan with Chuck Brown. Wow. Yeah. So that's that's my go-go connect. He was great. <laughs> you yes, know, yeah. and the thing, and the funny thing is, I would have to say, you know, as I'm <clears throat> really kind of looking back and, you know, as I, you know, when people are asking me about how I got into doing jazz, I really have to say that Chuck Brown was probably like one of my first entrees into jazz like that go go swing live album i mean he's doing all standards yeah. wow yeah you yeah, know yeah, he's yeah. doing take the a train midnight yeah, sun yeah. like that was i was i learned those songs yeah, Moody's from Moody. is that Moody? yeah yeah uh, yeah yeah i learned those songs from chuck brown wow yeah no doubt <laughs> now what as a as a youngster what music was you listening to what, what were you into so my dad, like I said earlier, he was a guitarist, and um, he loved blues, you know, because mm -hmm. he was from the South. Mm -hmm. So he listened to a lot of B.B. Um, King, Bobby Blue Bland, and um, and then those er those kind of dirty blues people like Clarence Carter. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but his favorite was Sam Cooke. Mm. So I grew up listening to a lot of Sam Cooke. And my sister was into the, you know, the popular music of the day. Mm -hmm. So from her, and she had really great taste in music. Wow. <laughs> so I, you know, I was exposed to, um, you know, Stevie Wonder. Me and my brother, we were huge Michael Jackson and Janet Jackson mm -hmm. fans. But she introduced me to people like... Diane Reeves and Pat Patrice Russian. She was really into Anita Baker, Angela Bofield. Mm. Like, so that was the stuff that I really, really loved, gotcha. um, you know, as a young person. And then 
I discovered, I guess, straight ahead jazz in a very, you know, because we weren't listening to that in the house, but, and I tell this story. I first heard the song April in Paris on a coffee commercial, commercial. I think it was Maxwell House. Wow. And it was, it wasn't like a jazzy version, but I just responded to like the lyrics and the, the melody mm -hmm. and I was like, wow, that's really beautiful. And I heard that song and I, um, I went to Dale Music Store. I got on the bus. Mm -hmm. Silver Spring. Yeah. Rolled up to Silver Spring. Uh -huh. Got the sheet music. You know, at that at that time, you know, I had, I think, uh, right before I started at Ellington, um, I was learning how to pluck out little stuff on, on the piano. And I got the sheet music, and I just started messing around and, like, hearing the different harmonies and the chords and, you know, two five ones yeah, and all that yeah. kind of beautiful stuff. And I was like, wow. And that was really, you know, kind of like the spark, mm, you know? And gotcha. I was like, I want to hear more of this. And I would find recordings of that song. And then that would lead me to other songs. Mm -hmm. And wow. so that was really yeah. kind of like the beginning, beginning. So was voice your first instrument? Mm -hmm. Okay. You, were you singing at an early age? You know, I'm not one of those people that, you know, oh, I was singing, you know, as soon as I could talk. And yeah. I, I, <laughs> no. Um, but I probably started singing, you know, in elementary school. I would do little things, middle school. I would Did have you a sing soloing. in a church? No. No, okay. So I never, well, we weren't, uh, I guess, um, consistent church gotcha. goers. Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> so yeah. that was not my experience. But okay. I sang in the Glee Club. Mm -hmm. Um you know, in elementary and middle school. So where'd you go to where'd you go to school in elementary and middle school? Elementary school, I went to Gage Eckington Elementary, okay. which um they've since torn down. But it was right near Howard, third and Elm Street okay. Northwest. Yeah. I I remember that that school, yeah. Yeah. It was very um it was probably the f one of the first or only open space mm -hmm. schools. Mm -hmm. In the district, very um, contemporary and kind of forward mm -hmm. thinking. So I went there. And they for, tore it down. Yeah, they've torn it down. I think it's like a park now or something. Wow. Yeah. Um, and then middle school, I went to uh, Brookland. Okay. So it's now just elementary, but it used to be elementary up and, to eighth grade. Okay. And then was that a Catholic school? Mm. -mm no. Okay. It's uh, right on uh, Michigan Avenue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like twelfth in Michigan. Yeah. Um, and then for high school, I was at Ellington. So, did you study music formally coming up? No, not until I got to Ellington. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, would you say you were bl late bloomer coming into music? I, I'm, I am the eternal late bloomer. <laughs> Everything. <laughs> it's all good. Yeah. yeah. I had a couple of, you know, middle school. We had this woman who would come. I mean, I sang in Glee Club, mm -hmm. but actually I had a very, very, I shouldn't say I didn't have any formal training. That's not true. Elementary school, I had a great uh, music teacher, Pamela Alexander. I know Pam. Pam, Pam she, she was the uh, over music when I started teaching in um, in uh, the District of Columbia, my first year, she was over the music, so she got she's the one that got me. In. That was Pam was your teacher. She yes. was my music teacher in elementary yeah. school, and uh, I was in awe of her. Yeah. And she lived around the corner from me. Wow! <laughs> and once I found that out, I was yeah. there kind of, you know, any excuse to walk up and down her street to see if she would come out and. Um, but she exposed us to so much. I oh, mean, yeah, the first good. time I heard the Beatles was in her class. And oh, yeah. the first time I heard the Nutcracker was in her class. Yeah. And she was just, you know, she just exposed us to a lot of, a lot of stuff. Yeah. I don't remember if we were actually doing music reading in her class. But mm -hmm. we were doing a lot of singing and a lot of history. And, mm -hmm. um, and then I, I played violin for a very, very short time mm -hmm. in elementary school. And that was when they would just give you an instrument. You know, what do you want to play? Uh -huh. Oh, I think I'll, you know, <laughs> I'll try this. And I was at home, 
<laughs> you know, driving my brother wow. crazy. So I, I shouldn't say I didn't have any, you know, form. But from elementary school and then middle school, I, I had like a, a few piano lessons. But it wasn't serious, serious, structured where I was practicing and that sort of thing yeah. until I got to Ellington. So what made you choose Duke Ellington? Then, because you had to audition. Did you have to audition to get mm -hmm. in? So you auditioned. Mm -hmm. How'd you get in? <laughs> well, you know, I could sing a little bit. Okay. <laughs> and I remember it took me a long time to settle on a song. I didn't know what I wanted, you know, what I uh -huh. really wanted to do. But I think um, my song ended up being, um, oh, man. Oh, man. It was a pop song by this woman, Brenda Starr. I think it was called like I Still Believe or something mm -hmm. like that. And um, you know, I didn't have a whole lot, you know, I hadn't been singing in church and so I didn't have a whole lot of like, you know, singing experience before I got there. But I sang well enough to, you know, yeah. pass my audition. So Duke Ellington is an art school. It's a high you know, uh uh I went to art school as well in Philly. Um what Why'd you choose Duke Ellington? I mean, did you did prior to going to Duke Ellington School of the Arts, did you say I want to be a singer, or did you say this might be interesting? You know. Well, I, my sister mentioned to me just kind of one day in passing. She was like, "Yeah, you know, do you know there's a school like for you know arts where you can go and study music? You know, you might want to think about you know doing that." And so that kind of planted the seed. But I, you know, I just always felt like, <laughs> we were kind of talking about this earlier, mm -hmm. just I've always been very awkward, very kind of shy, kind of like the outsider. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I felt like that all through elementary school and mm -hmm. middle school. And, you know, hearing about there being a school where I could go and just Fit in. be around <laughs> other people who were kind of yeah, strange yeah, like yeah. me. I uh -huh. was like, oh, that's where I should uh -huh. I should go there. I okay. should try to, to do that. And, you know, just the thought of, of being in a place where I, I had seen the movie Fame like 50 mm -hmm, times mm -hmm, at that mm -hmm. point. I was like, wow, it's like that. Yeah, yeah. I want to go there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> now, were you, did the jazz bug hit you prior to going to uh, Duke Ellington? Mm hmm Yeah, so I think that whole Maxwell House commercial and learning, you know, So you jazz started was, getting into jazz? Yeah, okay. like right before like right before that. Okay. Right? So maybe like eighth grade, I started kind of looking. Now, were you into like vocal jazz or instrumental jazz, or did it matter? I liked it all. I, my sister had a friend who, when I told her I liked jazz, she would make me these mixtapes. Oh, okay. And it wasn't straight ahead, but uh -huh. it was like, you know, smooth jazz. So I listened to a lot of Alex Bouillon, uh -huh. and I love the saxophone, uh -huh. Najee. Um, so she would make me stuff, like these little mixtapes, and mm. then I would, you know, find the stations on the dial that were playing, you know, I loved Patty Austin and stuff like that, but I didn't hear Billie Holiday and Ella until, you know, I was probably like 10th, 11th grade. Okay. Mm -hmm. So a lot of your musical development started at Duke Ellington? Mm -hmm. So what was that experience like at, at Duke Ellington? <sighs> wow. Well, um, classical, everything was classical. So you had to classical study classical bass. voice? So learning arias and art songs and um, music theory. I had a great music theory teacher, um, Dr. Peachy. Um, piano, uh, uh, Miss Gray was my piano teacher, who I still see, actually, who <laughs> in the neighborhood, she goes to church up the street from where I live. So. That was the, you know, the meat, the meat of it, singing mm -hmm. in ensemble, choir. Um, but it wasn't until senior year uh, or the summer before senior year that I started singing in the jazz band. I used to sit outside in the hallway and just listen. Okay. And I never had the, yeah. you know. At what point did you in. decide, I want to. 
pursue music, voice. It was it at Duke Ellington? Like professionally? I, yeah, this this is what I want to do. Not until so when I left Ellington, um, and I got to sing in the big band my senior year. That's how that's how Brian and I okay like, okay <laughs> really you know started to connect. come, come okay. together yeah connect. Um, but I didn't have the confidence. I didn't think that I could do music professionally. Really? So after I graduated, I went to school in Baltimore for a year, actually, because I thought I was going to be a writer, a journalist. Oh, and I was okay. like, I can write really and well. I, I'm gonna I noticed this. your writing. I said, oh, this, I said, she's really got this writing thing. <laughs> I said, well, we're going to talk about that. But yeah, okay. Ah, mm -hmm. oh, okay. Wow, that's that's wonderful. So, did music come easy for you? No. Well, the the theoretical stuff came easy. I don't. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't consider myself to be a natural singer, like someone who can just. Okay. I have to work at it. <laughs> like me. <laughs> no. no. I have to really, really work. You know, I have to work at it. And so you have a strong work ethic. I do. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yes. I'm a worker. Yeah. Some people, uh, I know that some people, they, it's just, music just, it seemed like easy. Mm -hmm. You know, I was, music, reading came easy for me, mm -hmm. like reading and, mm -hmm. you know, but like, I had to work on my ears mm -hmm. and, and, and then the creative part, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. but so, yeah, we all got to work at this thing. Yeah. It's a constant struggle mm -hmm. yeah same thing for me i've always been good at numbers and things like that so like you said the theory stuff on paper that's you know that okay. was kind of easy so you say mm -hmm. that it was in your 12th grade year you song in a big band mm -hmm. okay is that when you start checking out the ella Fitzgeralds and, and that sort of thing so davy yarborough come on now. was <laughs> you know he really is i have to say like the reason that I'm sitting here and I'm doing all this, oh, you know, wow. because, um, so my dad passed away in March of my freshman year at Ellington. Wow. And so I was kind of off, very off kilter, mm -hmm. you know, for a couple years after that, mm -hmm. just kind of floating, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, my grades were kind of, mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, everything just was kind of, you know, as a young person, just kind of trying to make sense out of yeah. everything. Mm -hmm. And so I used to sit out in the hallway and listen to the big band play, and I was like, oh, that sounds really good. And Yarbrough would come out and say, hey, you know, what, you, <laughs> you want to come in and sing? And, you know, and I'm no, 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 I don't want to do that. <laughs> and so he just kind of started to, Press the issue like he knew that I was um, I was in trouble mm -hmm. <laughs> you know yeah. I just kind of didn't really have Trying a lot of focus and yeah and so I don't know what it was he was just he saw me he some, saw someone who was in trouble and mm -hmm. he's like trying to reel me in and gotcha. so it's like um, he would chase me around and make me show him my report card and I was getting <laughs> you know I wasn't making good grades and um, and so he saw being in the band as a way for me to, you know, just have some kind of purpose. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so finally, I, you know, I started to go to rehearsals and started singing. And then that um, during that summer, I worked with him um, at his Washington Jazz Arts mm -hmm. Institute. And um, senior year, I was in the big band, and he was, like, really encouraging, you know, you can do this, you should do this. But I still didn't, you know, I didn't really get the bug until... After that first year of school in Baltimore, where I was studying communications and writing, and I was like, oh, I don't know really do this. <laughs> and I was listening to so much music. I was, just, you know, I was just, oh, that Sarah yeah. Vaughn live at Mr. Kelly's was on constant. Yeah. You know, and I was like, I want to do this, yeah. you know. And if it doesn't work out, I can always do something else. Mm -hmm. And so gotcha. my second year, or sophomore year, that's when I transferred to um the new school. Okay, in New York. we're gonna talk about that. Now at Duke Ellington, who was there? Who were some of the people that you said you met Brian <laughs> there? Mm -hmm. Was any any other musicians that we might know? Uh, was Janelle 
So Janelle, I'm a lot older than Janelle. <laughs> okay, Janelle came after. Janelle okay. came after. Okay, okay, yeah. gotcha. Yeah. All right. Trying to think. Um, her, her Leon, Scott. Leon Rawlins. Her, I, I'm older than all those people. Oh, really? All those people are after me. <laughs> okay, yeah. you're, old, you're old head. I got yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm 49. I'll be okay. 50 okay. All right. next year. Oh, so, wow. okay. um, yeah, I graduated from there. Brian and I graduated from there in 92. Okay. So gotcha. those folks came after. But Leon, you may know Leon Rawlins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, James Cheeks. Yeah, yeah, Jan. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think who else. What about was Sweet Cherie? Sure. Sh Sh she was, I think she was before me, or she may have been there when I was just getting there. I didn't okay. really know okay. her there. Um, yeah. Okay. Wow. All right. And so. Oh, Don Vonte. Don Vonte was it? Yeah. Okay. He was there. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, how'd you and, uh, Brian meet? <laughs> we're not going to go too oh, deep down the rabbit good hole. Good grief. Well, I guess we've known each other since ninth grade. Okay. But, you know, like I said, I was very awkward and just very nerdy. And I, you know, I um, was very sheltered. Uh-huh. Um, I wasn't, you know, I couldn't talk on the phone. And I oh, couldn't yeah, go hang yeah. out with boys and yeah, all that kind yeah. of stuff. So... But senior year, or the year before senior year, when I worked with um, Mr. Yarborough that summer before, um, Brian had come up. We were we were rehearsing at uh, Ellington, mm -hmm. and Brian had come up, and I think we you know we were talking, and um, that was the first time that we had actually started like having conversations mm -hmm. and things like that. And he he will say. Oh, when I heard you sing with the big band, <laughs> I fell in love. Man. I don't know if yeah. it's all of that, but yeah, we um, he he slipped me one day during like at the beginning of senior year. Mm -hmm. He slipped me his business card. Now he was senior year. Yeah. He had business yeah. cards. <laughs> Laugh, people fall out wow. when I tell yeah. them that. He like snips me his yeah. car, yeah. you know, like call me. And yeah. so I was talking to Mr. Yarbrough. I was like, you know, what is this dude about? Like, uh -huh. is he is he all right? Yeah. Uh -huh. And so Yarbrough sent us on our first date. Really? He got us tickets to Blues Alley. Wow. To see Ramsey Lewis. Wow. And my mother-in-law now, Brian's mom, she was chaperone. She had to drive us because okay. neither one uh -huh. of us had a license or a car. And she mm -hmm. drove us there. So that was like our first yeah. real date, yeah. you know. Wow, so, that's wonderful. Yeah. The rest is history. The rest is history. And Mr. Yarbrough played saxophone when we got married. He Whoa, played us down beautiful. the aisle. Yeah. Wow. Was Mr. Yarbrough playing flute and Reggie Workman playing bass for us. Wow. You had Reggie Workman on. Wow. He's another one of my surrogate yeah. dads. Who was okay. one of my instructors at the new school. Okay, beautiful. Mm -hmm. Wow, that. See, we. I learned so much <laughs> doing these interviews. That is beautiful. So, what is it like being married to a jazz musician, <laughs> <laughs> or 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 uh, or two jazz musicians being married? Oh man. Well, you know. Y'all fight over chord changes. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know I don't. People are always so intrigued uh -huh. by that. There, I remember this. One woman asked one time, "Does he play saxophone for you while you're in the bathtub?" <laughs> I was like, "Ma'am, no. Uh, yeah. <laughs> We're just two regular people yeah. at home." Yeah. Uh, um, you know, it's uh, interesting. I will say that we, um. We collaborate, but not, we do some things together, but then other things are very separate. Mm -hmm. You know, he's, um, well, he's very versatile. He can yeah, pretty much play everything, now. but he, yeah, oh. And he's in photography, <laughs> yeah. and, and you know you write, it's okay. Yeah, but he, you know, his, his, he loves like the, he's on the improvised, more improvised music scene, so mm -hmm. he does a lot of that sort of stuff. So, you know, it's interesting. Some things we're very um, connected, and then other things we each kind of are going our separate ways. But it's always, a, you know, a very delicate 
mm-hmm. balance, I think. Beautiful. <laughs> yes, that's a good thing. <laughs> All right. So, now, I didn't know you went to school in Baltimore. Okay, so you said after, uh, what, what school was that? It was uh, an all-girls Catholic school, okay. College of Notre Dame College, of okay. Maryland. Yeah. <laughs> you left that, and then mm-hmm. you went to the new school mm-hmm. in New York. Mm-hmm. What made you choose the new school? Um, well, I had been looking at the new school before, um, you know, during high school, like my senior year. <clears throat> I didn't, at that point, I, I never auditioned because going to school in New York City, it just seemed like such a far off dream. Yeah. I was like, I, I would never be able to do that, you uh-huh. know. But after um, that first year, so when I was in school in Baltimore, Brian was at a University of the Arts in Philly. I didn't know that. For that, okay. yeah, for yeah. that first year. And then we both decided that we were going to transfer to the new school and go to New York. Oh, wow. And, um, yeah, I just wanted to be, I just wanted to try it. I was like, if I'm going to study jazz, like, I got to be in New York. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know, I got to yeah. be with Happening. Yeah. Where the Happenings. And in, ni- in the early 90s, so that was 93, um, it was just, it, it, there was that resurgence. So, like, yeah, Young the Lions young line, yeah. and Roy well, Hargrove. So, and, were you, did, you hang, did y'all hang out on the scene at that time? Uh well I wasn't hanging out with anybody famous but <laughs> I no, was. Did y'all go to the like the, the jazz clubs and oh, all that? Oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. That was a great period. Oh my gosh, mm. Sweet Basil. Um, you know I saw Betty Carter for the first time mm-hmm. at um I think she was playing at CBGB's mm-hmm. and uh, Abby Lincoln who's my favorite I saw her play lots of times just various play Blue Note and. You know, festivals in the park and that sort of thing. Yeah. Wow. So, you in this new environment, is is jazz bubbling in you on another level? Okay. And, and, and at the new school? Yeah. What was that experience like? Oh, man. It really was like a dream. You know, really? if yeah. you love the music and you, I mean, mm-hmm. just... Studying music and then against that backdrop of mm-hmm. New York, like being in New York City. I mean, and it was rough. It, <laughs> it yeah. was really rough. Yeah. New York is, you know, expensive, and I had all kinds of weird living, you know, yeah, situations yeah. I was trying to work out. And um, but my instructors were just. I had some really, really great. Who teachers. who were some that stick out for you? Oh man! You said Reggie. So Workman? Reggie was one of my. One of my teachers, Cecil McBee, Ooh. Buster Williams, um, Terry Thornton, uh, Dr. Richard Harper, mm. um, who <clears throat> who um, was a vocalist but also a musician, played trombone, and he actually was just here a few weeks ago visiting mm-hmm. with his wife. Um, Amy London, oh man, just so many. Were the musicians focused and serious that you were in that? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, My senior year, I actually got to play with, um, so my ensemble, senior, that last semester at the new school was uh, Cedric Mitchell, Mm -hmm. Kenyatta Beasley, Keith Loftus, Mm -hmm. uh, Marcus Baylor, mm-hmm. um, Jennifer Vincent on bass, and we got to go and, and perform at the IJE. Wow! And that was like my last, um, like my last year at the new school, and that was like one of the highlights. It's like wow! And Buster Williams was our ensemble instructor during wow. that yeah. during that semester. So you were there with people who were. You, yeah, you had, had to, to have, your, <laughs> you had to have yeah. your stuff together. Yeah. yeah. And and that's I think that's good because that if you're gonna do music, you got to do it. It's mm-hmm. not you, you can't put your toe in the water. You gotta go all the way. You gotta say, okay, I'm gonna dive into and 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 and, and deal with whatever whatever mm-hmm. I have to deal with. Yeah. So it's good to have that type of environment. And one of the things I really liked, um, you know, at the new school was that they didn't 
it, it may be different now, but at that time they did not separate us. So vocalists were taking the same classes as the instrumentalists, wow. you know, so you mm -hmm. had to know you know, I'm in bebop harmony with, you know, I'm like one of two singers and all instrumentalists or in my theory class. We had a class called Theory and Performance where we had to take everything we were learning in theory and learn how to apply it, you know, how to write, how to uh, improvise using, you know, these concepts. And so we were, um, they were creating musicians, you know, yeah, not yeah. just Vocal, singers. Yeah, singers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So do you find yourself... Uh, Listening to instrumental, just or, or, or more vocal, or, or does it matter, or do you kind of? Um... Well, I'm very partial to horn players. Okay. <laughs> you know, I loved Dexter Gordon and Wayne Shorter, mm -hmm. my favorites. I love Errol Garner. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's kind of a, a mix of. Um, it's a mix, you know. Mm -hmm. What jazz vocalist would you say had the most profound impact on you or your direction as a jazz vocalist? Oh, so Billie Holiday. What was it about and Billie Holiday? So my first, the very first Billie Holiday uh, recording that I ever heard was the Lady in Satin album. Mm -hmm. And that was <clears throat> her next to last recording, but it's like with these lush strings. Mm. And her voice at that point, she had like very little, a very small range. It was very kind of ragged around the, mm -hmm. the edges. But I just thought it was the most beautiful thing yeah. I had ever heard. <laughs> it was just like the most beautiful, most honest, mm -hmm singing that I had ever heard in my whole life. And yeah. I just, wow. I don't know, it just really, really touched me. Yeah. And then I discovered Abby Lincoln, who yeah. is basically coming Down right out below. of Billy, Billy Holiday. <laughs> and, um, and she not only is a, a fabulous singer, but also a great composer, yeah. you know, and so, for me, I think, you know, it started with Billy and then Abby. Like, those two are my, my I would say, my biggest yeah. influences. And one thing I, what I dig about, and and as, because, you know, when you're coming up studying people, you, you're kind of trying to emulate, like, I was, I'm a bird, mm -hmm. you know, bird. But at a certain point, you have to find your own voice. And so, like, Abby and uh, Billy Holiday and others, they 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 found their own voice and it's like and it was beyond just the technical aspect of singing it was like the way they carried the song mm -hmm. the what they put into the life that they put into that song mm -hmm. um do you find yourself getting that um um from the singers you love <clears throat> that aspect well i think um for me the biggest part of kind of finding my own voice has been through writing, oh, you know, wow. like yeah. writing your own, your own material or yeah. arranging, you know, um, I've always had a very vivid imagination. <laughs> yeah. So for me, like being able to just create something new um, that I haven't heard before, um, I think has kind of helped me yeah. to kind of form my own style. Beautiful. All right. So now, we brought you back to D.C. <laughs> <laughs> we brought you back home. So, I was in New York when 9-11 happened. Wow. And um, that's a whole crazy story. Did that you I see that? Give. Did you see? So, at that point, I was living in Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. And I was temping. And the week right before 9-11 happened, I had a temp job right down there in that in that area. Wow. And so the, that following week, I actually had a, a, a new job, you know, further uptown, like midtown. And um, I just remember getting ready for work that morning and getting out of the shower. And I had the news on. I come out and the screen's all fuzzy. 
I'm like, okay, that's weird. <laughs> so I changed the station and I get one, there was like one station that had, um, you know, their antenna like on the top of the world, uh, of the Empire State Building. So like everybody who had their antennas on the top of the World Trade Center, everything was just messed up. And then I, I saw the images, you know, of fire, the, the towers burning, and I'm just kind of sitting there. You look like this on TV. Yeah. Okay. And um and as I'm watching, at that moment, the second plane hit the towers. And so um it was just so surreal. Just like everyone who yeah, had that, yeah. you know, it's just like unbelievable. And so I came back to, at that point, Brian was um, already living here in mm -hmm. D.C. And I was still in New York. And um, I came down, my mom, I finally got in touch with my mom. And she's like, I need to see you. I'm really nervous. This whole thing is weird. And so I came home and, um, you know, I was hanging out and um, with Brian. And he was just kind of like. I think it's time for you to. <laughs> and I was like, well, I'm not coming nowhere until like there's some, uh -huh. <laughs> there's some serious yeah, yeah. commitment. Like, we <laughs> met, like what's happening? <laughs> and so um, I think like that next month, right before my lease was up um, at my apartment, he came up and proposed. Wow. And so he came yeah. back to DC. Wow. Yeah. Wow, that's something. <laughs> And so um, you also decided to go to Howard University, mm -hmm. HU. Mm -hmm. um, what uh, precipitated that? Um, well, I was in New York, and I was like I said, I was just like temping, wasn't really sure, wasn't really gigging, and um, I felt very removed from um, like scene and, and music and I was like well, what am I doing like am I just gonna be working from here on out or am I actually going to pursue mm -hmm. music and so I actually had um, started the process of applying to City College mm -hmm. um, in New York to go back and do my master's in music but um, when I moved back to DC I um, started looking into the program at Howard I was like I still wanna I want to go back to school Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, I looked into the program. I went, I met um, Kanetra Miller. I met Kahembe Eichelberg. I auditioned for them. And, yeah. Wow. <laughs> so at Howard, mm -hmm. um, were you a part of Afro Blue? I sang in Afro Blue for two, I guess, two semesters. So I, I did my master's in three semesters. I just... Mm -hmm. I just went hard. <laughs> I went hard um, because we got married. Let's see, that was September two thousand one, mm -hmm. and my plan was to start that fall. I was like, okay, yeah, I can, mm -hmm. I can get married and I can start school. And, and <laughs> Brian was like, uh, I think you need to defer. <laughs> so I deferred until uh, January. 2022, but I still was trying to be done by 20, mm -hmm. spring 2023. And so um, I sang in Afro Blue, like the, so the first semester I was there, I, I was singing in the big ensemble. Mm -hmm. And then when I came back that following fall, I got the graduate teaching assistantship. Okay. And so I was Kanadra Miller's assistant. Um, and part of the assistantship was that you were to sing in Afro Blue and also be her, you know, her assistant. Mm -hmm. um, so I sang in that ensemble for two semesters. Okay. What was it like working with Kenatra Miller? I mean, if you let me tell it, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> she's the best vocal jazz instructor like in the world. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not. And I'm not being, wow. you know, facetious or like when I say that, she really is brilliant. Mm. Really? She's a brilliant educator, a brilliant singer, a, br a brilliant communicator, a brilliant musician. Like she really, really helped me to grow, not only as an educator, but as a as a singer and a writer and mm. a ranger and yeah. Yeah, I mean, from what I hear, she's done some, 
I, that <laughs> she's the best. Afro blue. It was like wow. I mean, it's and uh, it's like those arrangements. Mm-hmm. Did she she came up with a lot of those arrangements? Mm-hmm. Wow. Did she help you? I know you do a vocal arrangements as well. Did she did she help you to learn how to do that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. So I took her um, her vocal arranging course um, mm-hmm. as a grad student, and that was where I really started to. Um, do that sort of writing for the first time. Wow. Mm-hmm. Now, what is uh, um, sassy? So sassy is the um, treble voice ensemble. So the treble voice. Well, I, I I I feel like I need to start using better terminology okay. than just okay. you know things are so much fluid now. I don't mm. feel co- always oh, comfortable okay. saying uh, the female vocal oh, oh. <laughs> ensemble. <laughs> Gotcha. So I, I got the <laughs> treble voice, okay. so soprano okay. and alto okay. Gotcha. Um, okay. ensemble. So okay. And I directed that group. Back now, how, okay, so that's all those who would be classified as female? Is that all oh, good? <laughs> gotcha. <Yeah. laughs> okay. Um, and so, they have, so there are two groups. There are three. Really? Mm-hmm. What's yeah, that? so there are three vocal jazz vocal ensembles. There's um, HU Jazz Singers, which used to be called Whole Lot of Jazz Singers back when I was a uh, uh-huh. grad student at Howard. Um, so HU Jazz Singers, Sassy, and Afro Blue. Oh, wow. And so HU Jazz Singers and Sassy kind of act as like feeder groups into okay. um, Afro Blue. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah, when I was at Howard, we didn't have a. I don't. We didn't have a any jazz. I don't think we had any jazz groups like in that context. Either it was in the A band or the B band. <laughs> yeah, contraband and that sort of orchestra. But uh, I don't think we had. I don't think uh, uh, we had a vocal ensemble. Well, Kanetra, I think, started that. They recruited her to come there to yeah, do, to do yes. that. Um, she was in, I think she was teaching in Australia at the time when they recruited oh, wow. her to come okay. to Howard. So when I got to Howard in 2002, I think she had only just gotten there maybe like a year, maybe a year or two right before I got there. Mm. So how would you say, like coming from the new school with that experience and then coming to Howard, Grad school at Howard University. Did they impact you differently? Both experiences. <clears throat> yes. Um, so in between graduating from the new school and starting at Howard, for me, it was seven years. <laughs> really? Mm-hmm. Oh wow. So it was seven years of me just kind of bopping around, doing all kinds of different jobs. I was working in finance for a minute. I was I was doing all kinds of... Oh, I, so it really got you back focused on the music? Yeah. Okay. And yeah. going to school, I think, as an adult, as opposed to coming right out of high school, it's a totally yeah. different experience. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. I felt so much more in my body. Yeah. Um, and so much more focused. Now, it was a lot harder because I was working full-time for um, the Cathedral Choral Society. Mm-hmm as their uh, director of finance and mm-hmm. administration um, and doing my master's at Howard full time. But I just felt, um, you know, the energy was definitely much different being at a, um, at a HBCU. Mm-hmm. Um, even though there was a, a, a good number of, I never really felt when I was at the new school that it was a PWI. Mm-hmm. I, you know, because there were there were so many, um, you know, African American students gotcha. there. Mm-hmm. I think it, that balance has changed. Okay. I think in more recent years. Yeah. But um, yeah, the energy was different going in as an adult, mm-hmm. being more focused, being more in my, you know, in my body and like. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Now you're currently working on your doctorate. Talk to the people about it. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I must be crazy. I don't know. No, that's that, um, that's 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 good. So, Dr. Saiz Kamaladeen, mm-hmm. who teaches at Howard University, who was my music theory instructor in ninth grade at Duke Ellington. Wow. <laughs> wow. 
Um, you know, he's um, director of the, the graduate studies in music at Howard. Mm -hmm. And he just always has encouraged us to go as far as we can, as far as, yes. you know, because it's very important, I think, especially in terms of black music, mm -hmm. for us, our voices to be a part of the academic conversation. Mm -hmm. So I mm -hmm. know that you're, you know, you're a publisher and you mm -hmm. publish educate jazz educational materials, but there's not a whole lot of, yeah. you know, we have people like Willard Jenkins. Um, you know, we have some people who yeah. are writing and documenting. Yeah. You know Munir Nasser? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Munir's yes. known that, writing too. Um, yeah. But there's not a whole lot, if you think about, you know, the jazz text, yeah. jazz history textbooks and things like that, mm -hmm. they're written by people who don't look yeah. like us. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so Dr. Kamaladeen's whole thing is like, we, this is our music. We should be the author authoritarians on the music. Mm -hmm. There are, you know, uh, kind of barriers or like gatekeepers into that, um, those areas that if you have the credentials, you know, you're more, you have more access to those no sorts of, mm -hmm. you know, pursuits. Mm -hmm. So his thing was always like, go, just go, get your doctorate, get your doctorate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I had gone to the Jazz uh, Education Network Conference, mm -hmm. January 2020, mm. me and Allison Crockett mm -hmm. went together. And just going around to the different workshops and the, the presentations and just not seeing mm -hmm. a lot of people who look like us at this jazz, you know, this conference on jazz music, you know? Now, do you think it's because they are not accepting of that, or we're not just, we just want to be on stage singing and not pursuing those type of opportunities to be that, um, on, on that side of the equation. Yeah, I think that there's not, well, if you think about the, um, the number of jazz programs at HBCUs, there's yeah. not a lot, <laughs> you yeah. know, there are only a few. And so you have these more established institutions um, that are studying jazz and that are looking at all different aspects of the music, not just the performance aspect, but also the historical aspect, the you know composition, the education aspect. And so they're just there's just a gap, you mm -hmm. know, there's a gap there. And so I was at the conference, and not to say that there was, you know, it wasn't bad information, it wasn't wrong information, but it just, you know, it just, to me, it lacked the spirit and the essence of where the music really, really comes from. It's not just what's written on the page. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not it's that. It's from field hollers, stuff you, when, you, when you talk about grandma was. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the part that is mm -hmm. not being yeah. Put it, the yeah. cultural yeah. aspect yeah. of the music is, you know, mm -hmm. it's just, you know, it has become this this thing, this written, you know, oh, this amazingly complex music that's a puzzle to solve. And but it's not that, you know, and that's why I do this, mm -hmm. because I mean, because you have to get the stories. Mm -hmm. We got to make the connect. It goes back to connecting with the past, mm -hmm. not just the music, mm -hmm. but also the cultural aspects that went mm -hmm. into creating the music. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why what I like about hip hop, although it's, it's kind of going in some uh, different direction, they they saw hip hop not as just music, but as culture. Mm -hmm. And so, even you, though you might have an Eminem who's into the hip, he's also a part of the culture, mm -hmm. and he's embraced. And he's a great rapper, but he's also connected to the culture of it. And I don't know if the same thing can be said for jazz. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I get where you actually are coming from. But yeah. Yeah, and that was one of the things that I, um, you know, as I was teaching my jazz history class for the, for, for the very first time this past semester, it's like 
the music comes from somewhere. You know, it's not just this thing. It's not, you know, this thing this that was came from nothing. You know, there is an actual lineage. Yeah. yeah. And so um, I think I hope that I did a good job of oh, you, know, I you know of like getting that part um, of it across because at the end. You know, the stuff that the kids were writing, it was just really, they were like, yeah, I could hear, you know, the, this sounded like, you know, <laughs> the church music we listened uh -huh. to or mm -hmm. the field yeah. hollers or, you know, mm -hmm. I, I feel like they really Make those connections. got it. Yeah. And so when I left that conference at that, at that, at the end, I was like, I got to go back and do my doctorate. I got to do it. Yeah. So where are you doing your doctorate at? I am doing my doctorate at George Mason University okay. out in Fairfax. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. And you almost, uh, well, I'm a you're on the way. other side of it, right? I'm a little ways. <laughs> okay. Well, keep on. You know, the doctoral thing, it's a, uh, it's a marathon, you know. It's just, I feel like it's just an endurance thing, yeah. you know. Yeah. And so I'm for the most part done with my coursework, but now it's, you know, Entering that last phase, but yeah. um, I want to do that at some at some point. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll see. What I've learned a lot about myself. Yeah. Doing this process. I mean, mm -hmm. I I started fall twenty twenty, like right at the height of the pandemic yeah, yeah. and doing everything online, and it just um, it's been a great experience. There's some great um, professors yeah. out there. I've been. Uh, Dr. Darden Purcell, she mm. runs the Jazz Studies uh, program. She's a vocalist. Um, but I've just had the chance to study. I've been studying piano with Wade Beach. Wade Beach. I played with him last yesterday. Oh, yeah, he's yeah, so good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Jim Carroll. Um, yeah, it's just, oh, Victor Provo. So I played in the Steel Pan Ensemble wow. for he's two great, semesters. Yeah. And um, it's just been a fantastic experience. You've had a, it's like you've had a great like going from Duke Ellington, like the the teachers that and experiences, like it seemed like it was already pre designed for you to do whatever you with it is you, <laughs> that you wanted to, and it seemed like you you've been set up for that. Looking back now, it, uh, yeah. I can say that you know, in the thick of it, in the midst, I yeah, just yeah. never really felt like I knew. I was like, what am I doing? <laughs> well, you know, that's the thing about when you when you're in it. You don't know where it's gonna lead. You just gotta mm -hmm. keep keep walking, mm -hmm. you know. And it'll start making sense yeah. when you it, in retrospect. Yeah. But while you're going through it, you <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm really trying to, you know, as I'm entering, you know, the next phase of uh -huh. life, um, really trying to adopt an attitude of just um, just saying yes and just being open to mm -hmm. different kinds of experiences. Okay. So let's talk about you as a performer, because um, you also doing all this. You perform, <laughs> you sing, you do gigs. Right? <laughs> I want to ask you: Do you remember your first gig? Oh. Um. Yes, I do. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I think so. So mm -hmm. I, if I'm thinking about like my very first, first performance as a jazz singer, I would say that would have to be in high school. We did this thing. It was a fundraiser at Ellington. I remember it was called the Sunday Serenade, and uh, I think Brian was performing with with us. And uh, I remember it was on a Sunday, and uh, it was like a ice cream Sunday and mm -hmm. play on, the, on mm -hmm. Sunday. And we performed, I sang Summertime and I think one or two other tunes. And right after that gig, Mr. Yarborough took me to, it was a, ju a jazz club called Kate's. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if you remember. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think Ronnie Wells was performing. And she let me come up and sit in. Wow. And I sang Summertime, like in this packed jazz club. Like, <laughs> wow. And 
I was like, this, I, I want to do this for the rest of my life. <laughs> I was like, this is the most, it was the most amazing experience. Um, but I don't know that I can say I remember maybe like my first professional gig post, uh, you know, college. I don't know. Gotcha. I don't know if I can remember. Do you love performing? I do love performing. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm probably the most myself when I'm in a in a position where I'm like performing and I'm now we have all kinds of different kinds of situations mm -hmm, performing, mm -hmm. right? Like you, like club dates mm -hmm. or just, you know, your background music or your, mm -hmm. but the times when I'm able to do like my own music, my own compositions, my own arrangements, yes. I got a good band and the energy is, is good. It's like flying yeah. or something. Yeah. It's just we were talking about, uh, like I, uh, before we started uh, recording, uh, do you still get nervous? <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I'm nervous now. I'm nervous. Why? Yeah, I get. I, every time I'm nervous, before really? I just, you know, I'm just, yeah. Every yeah. time my stomach, I get the stomach thing. I'm really? like kind of trembling. Wow. I'm, yeah, I try to psych myself out. Sometimes if I if I can, you know, I got my headphones on. Before the gig, I'm listening. Sometimes I'm listening to some Chuck uh -huh. or some Go Go or yeah. just something to just like get me, you know, feeling good. And, yeah. yeah. So you have the the Settles Quintet. Is that called the Settles Quintet? Mm -hmm. Okay. What is the Settles Quintet? So the Settles Quintet is, um, you know, when Brian and I perform together. Okay. Um, we perform under the name the Settles Quintet. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And you also. Uh, um, perform for the you performed for, at the Washington Women in Jazz Festival. Yeah. Okay. Is that more of your own your you, you your own thing, or you just kind of putting? Well, it depends. So Amy Bormitt, uh -huh. um is the founder creator of the yeah. Washington Women in Jazz Festival, and I for I actually pre presented. Or I performed on her very first one. So I think this year is the 13th year. Um, but I performed the very, very first year. She did it as a, like a residency at Twins okay. on, Fort, on uh, U Street. <clears throat> and um, she did like one show a week for a month. Okay. Um, and I performed with... Uh, Lee Pilzer, she, mm -hmm. was, she, was, she was putting like duos together with the rhythm section. And um, the next year, she added an educational component. And so she's like, yeah, let's do some presentations. We were doing them out at the um, Smithsonian Anacostia oh, Museum wow. out in Southeast. Mm -hmm. And so I would just feature a, a different jazz vocalist each year. I think the very first year we did Abby Lincoln, I think. Mm. And so I would do a multimedia presentation on like their life and their music. And then we would do a short set where we would perform some of their music. And so, and then sometimes, you know, she has invited me to come and perform as a part of her band. Or sometimes she's, some years we've done like a showcase where um, me and Christy Dashiel one time mm -hmm. um, have done those together. So it just, it's just a, you know, whatever, wherever she, she wants me to be and go, I kind of go. So when we gonna get that CD? <laughs> <laughs> it got to be on the horizon. <laughs> yeah. I know you want to get through school. And, that is and, the yeah. big, you know, thing. everyone's like, why don't you have a seat? Mm -hmm. Why don't you have a recording? Mm -hmm. um, it's it's coming. We're okay. in talks okay. about doing something, Ashy, Amy, and I Beautiful. together. So it's, um, it's in the works. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's talk about you as an educator because you have, you taught at, Howard University, you, you work with uh, the uh, Washington, uh, David Yarbrough's, mm -hmm. the young people, what's that? Mm -hmm. The Washington Jazz Arts it, Institute. Okay, Jazz mm -hmm. Arts Institute. So, what has your experience been like as an educator? Um, so, originally, I never wanted to teach. I thought, when I left new school, I was going to be 
singing all over the world. <laughs> Bomb me, yeah. world traveler. <laughs> just, you know, yeah. having this glamorous life yeah. as a jazz singer. Um, but since the opportunity has presented itself, it's just, it's been very, it's been very rewarding and very, um, I think you really learn a lot about yourself nope. when you're put in the position of having to um, be responsible for imparting information. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> especially to young, young minds. Yeah. You know, so it's been a challenge, but um, yeah, it's it's been a good um a good way for me to kind of chat to channel my creative energy not only into like music but into also creating these experiences these mm -hmm. learning experiences for what are some of the challenges of teaching um so some of the challenges i think um well, I think most specifically in teaching jazz, when you have a student who's not totally convinced that this is what they want to be doing, <laughs> you know? And so it feels like um, a chore to them. So I think, you know, in my mind, this music is the most incredible, most otherworldly stuff ever you know but when you're dealing with someone who's like why we got to be learning this old stuff why are we why are we studying singers that <laughs> that you know were alive 50 60 100 years ago but it's like i think the initial challenge is kind of breaking through but once you're able to show them well you like this person well, this is, you can trace back to what this person is doing all the way back to what this person did, yeah. you know? And I think that light bulb moment, when you get that, yeah. you know, it's, it makes it worth it. But yeah. I think there's, um, with this new generation, there's, a, I mean, we were talking about this mm -hmm. earlier about like really having them tap into what came before. They just really think they got it all figured out. Mm -hmm. Well, this is what I want to do. And, you know, why do I have to listen to that in order to be, I already know how to do it. Yeah. You know, it's like, mm, I, don't I know. actually think that, and I've always said this, that because one of the hardest challenges of teaching is motivating students. They should have motivation education, whereas they teach kids to be about the idea of excellence, expanding your, you know, checking out different stuff, developing your aesthetic value and all this kind of thing. Because a lot of our kids are not motivated. And a lot of that is because they have, it's, it's so easy to access things. They can go Google, and there's so much stuff coming at them. Mm -hmm. And they, and they're into that, whatever they're into. And so, um, just to be able to motivate the, the students, so I, I know I know that it's a challenge on the elementary level, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's up in, in uh, um, I see it's up in the college mm -hmm. uh, level too. Yeah, yeah. I think for me, that that has definitely been a challenge because you feel like you have to be on all the time, and you have to be um, making the music so appealing that they want to, yeah. you know, that they want to do it. And I'm like, I don't want to work so hard <laughs> to yeah. not to, to like really show you that this is, you know, because, you know, we have these students at these, you know, I hate to say it at these PWIs and in these jazz programs where they're coming at it from a totally different point of view. I mm. think, Sometimes what happens is because we are such a creative people and we're always making new things that we tend to sometimes want to throw away the old yeah. stuff. Like, oh, we already did that. We're yeah. on to the next thing. <laughs> yeah, but not really seeing the value of well, this yeah. music that has spawned 
all the contemporary yeah. music that you know that we enjoy. My today. son is my son is into uh, he he raps and he's he produces and, and but and I'm try I try to help him. He don't want my help. He wants to do it his way. And I said, go ahead, have at it. You know, because uh, I don't know. One thing about people who pursue jazz. I would say we're the most open-minded people because we're actually going back, checking out music from the 20s. Mm -hmm. We can appreciate the music of our time, mm -hmm. but we also go back and check out the, you know, I never knew Charlie Parker, but his, I know him through his music. He mm -hmm. died 15 years before I was born. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know where we got this closed mind with, okay, we just into what we into today. Well, I, I think, a lot of it is is exposure. Like I said, like I had great musical experiences in in school, yeah. in school settings. So I had people who were exposing me to different stuff, you yeah. know, different kinds of music, different, you know, styles of playing, yeah. different, you know, historical figures throughout music. And I think you know, as the music programs are being pulled and the, the students don't have access to that more formalized sort of training, um, they are at a disadvantage, you know, because it now it's generational. You know, if your parents aren't listening to, you know, they're listening to stuff that their parents are listening to and their parents yeah. are listening to what, what they're listening yeah. to. But what know? struck me about, you said like used to, at in high school, you would sit outside of the jazz ensemble and just listen. So it had to be something. Nobody told you to do that, instructed you to do that. It was something that hit you that you was like, this sounds good, this feels good. You know, um, like I never got into jazz because none of my family's in jazz. I was just, I heard it and it knocked me out. Mm -hmm. It was no explaining it, it was no, uh, trying to, the history, and the, I get all that. It just, and I, I'm talking about Charlie Parker, mm -hmm. not at 12, mm -hmm. knocked me out like, wow. Mm -hmm. And so, I don't know what that is, but everything can't be explained. Mm -hmm. You know, you gotta, I, there, when I was coming up, I, I, <laughs> I remember the older guys, you say you either got it or you don't. And I don't know, I, I was never, I never was taught jazz in the mm -hmm. sense of, okay, somebody trying to explain to me. I actually was going out trying to seek it, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and that's how I was able to, you know, get it like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't know. Maybe, you know, you do find those students who are just attracted to mm -hmm. jazz. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, and that's always fun. <laughs> that is, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think about our graduates from Howard that are just out now in the world doing just some amazing, wow. you know, Christy Dashiell and yeah. Rochelle Rice and Jillian Willis and yeah. Akep and Quelle and um, they're just out there just yeah. just doing it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's cool. yeah. So do you have a musical philosophy? Wow. <laughs> I don't know that I that I actually have a musical philosophy. I, um Wow. I don't know. Um okay. I guess I just um I just try I, I just I guess my philosophy is just to know that um you know, we stand on the shoulders that, of everyone who came before us no and that we come from a very rich culture of, mm -hmm. um, you know, music that wasn't just music. You mm -hmm. know, it was a part of everyday yes, functional. life, yeah. functional. Yeah. Yeah. And so I never want to forget um that part of the of mm. the music and I, I think you know as I'm moving through and I'm having a chance to educate mm. um, young people that that probably is my 
you know, kind of my philosophy that mm-hmm. music has a purpose mm-hmm. other than just to entertain. You Beautiful. know, it's no, to that's, yeah, that, that's, inspire that's, and yeah. motivate. I feel, you know, a lot of my um, stuff that I write now, I'm, I'm really venturing into some more political yeah. territory. And, yeah. um, but it has a purpose, yeah. you know, yeah. and I think that there's a lot, there's so much happening right now yeah. that there's there's a lot to write about. No doubt. You know? Yeah. So what kind of teacher are you? Are you... Uh, are you cool? Are you mean? Are you strict? <laughs> are you? Are you? Are, are, ah. You know, you know, teachers can come in different. You know, so what kind of teacher is Jessica? You know, I think my favorite. Uh, yeah. I read, um, you, which you shouldn't do, but I read on one of those websites where you can rate your professors. <laughs> Someone wrote on there that I was firm uh-huh. but fair. Okay, that's that's. Yeah. And I I really like that. I was yeah. like, yeah, yeah I'm <laughs> firm. I think uh, you know I am. Some, I can be easy, easy like Sunday morning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you know I can also be very, um, you know, not my. I just want most important to me is that students actually absorb the information yeah so i make myself available if they're not getting it in class then you know i'm like you can come and see me after class during office hours we'll work out well you know we can get on zoom i can you know re-explain it maybe this way that way so i think i am um uh in that way i'm a i'm a really yeah it seems like in today today's time you have to be so gentle with the kids they're so <laughs> sensitive they go run to tell they go run tell that you know so you can't you know back in when i was coming the teacher could cuss you out <laughs> now you got to watch everything you like you say uh how do you want me to refer to you as you know you, all this yeah. political correctness and stuff uh do you find you have to you ha- you straight jacket it in that way or are you able to really Cause well, sometimes, it is a consideration now, yeah, you know, yeah. because you things can be misconstrued or, you know, especially if the student doesn't really know you. You mm-hmm. know, I, I work a lot with the um, the freshmen, and so they're just getting there. They don't know me. I don't know them. They don't know my, um, you know, the way I work, or they don't know my sense of humor. If I make a joke, you know, they're taking it to heart and that sort of thing. Or, um, you know, everybody has cell phones and record, you know, they can record you. And so I feel like there is a certain sense of, you know, trepidation. There's a different kind of way that you got to move yeah. um, now. But I try not to let that, you know, I. I am who I am, yeah. and you know anything that I say in class, you know, I, I don't mind saying it for the administration, yeah. you know. So yeah. we've had a lot. If you go back, being under Mister Irby <laughs> in the jazz, <laughs> see, we're from the old school. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, we boy. call that, you know. So we're up on the third floor of the uh, fine arts building, yeah, and yeah. they're down in the basement. Yeah. And so he would say, "Yeah, you know, that's how we talk down the yeah. basement. You come down in the basement, yeah. you're gonna hear something different." Oh, that's funny. Oh, all right, we almost done here. Uh, you also are presenter, and let as you as you alluded to, as you mentioned, and uh, you do multimedia presentations on jazz history. Um, um, and did you would I was reading that you were doing something on Betty Carter. Did you do that already? So I have, um, as part of, um, well, actually, the very first presentation I did actually was out at the Strathmore as part of one of their series. And Betty Scott um, had gotten me. And I think it probably was on Billie Holiday. Mm -hmm. And then that following year, or or when I started working with Amy, then then I started doing them with her. But um, 
I'm sorry. Where was I going on with that? <laughs> well, I was just talking about. Um, I, I, I read. Oh, Betty Carter. Betty Carter. You asked about yeah. Betty, Betty Carter. Betty So Betty Carter was one of um, the one of the presentations that I did as part of Amy's festival. Okay. But that I actually had the chance to do that presentation at University of Pittsburgh mm. when Jerry Allen was running the jazz program. So they would do, um, every year they do a, a, a symposium. Okay. And so one year they had invited Afro Blue to come and do some stuff. And so um, I had the opportunity to present my, my Betty Carter wow. presentation there. And Jerry Allen was there. The was Jerry at Howard when you were there? She no. was, okay. Yeah, so you said you met Betty Bebop Carter. Well, I didn't meet her, but I, I got to see her yeah. a few times I actually live. played with her. Yeah, no. I was on her very first Jazz Ahead group program. Wow. Yeah, and, and uh, she she was oh man, I was nervous. Yeah, because she know she knows the music. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, um, she was one of those that was um, you know schooling. Yeah, you know hers was a school, much yeah. like um, you know the jazz messengers yeah you yeah. know it's like coming through that um that art blakey kind of yeah so did you have to do a lot of transcribing have you done a lot of tra uh, vocal transcriptions or so um yeah so they would have us doing stuff like that in undergrad mm -hmm. um and then when I got to um, to Howard, we, we do a lot of, with the students, a lot of oral transcriptions. So not necessarily having them written yeah. down, but being well, able to yeah. sing them along with the recording and then at some point without yeah. the recording. Yeah. Um, but I did a project um, for one of my courses at George, George Mason where I just wrote out like five or six. Wow. Rec uh, Scat with syllables and wow. everything. Yeah, because you have you have some you you transcribed a, a vocal like a, a Ella Fitzgerald solo, uh -huh. and actually had to. Uh -huh. Wow. So it was a lot of slow yeah, down, yeah, like yeah, yeah. people. <laughs> <laughs> trying to wow. figure, That's figure out those syllables. Wow. Because um, you have some jazz vocalists who just they're singers. They they sing the song, and then they let, step out the way. So you do you. Scat and do all that kind of stuff. You yeah. know, I try. I, you know, yeah. I wouldn't say I'm the best improviser, but um, you know, I have my I have my moments. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. You wrote an article entitled Two Heads Are Better Than One: The Artistry of Shirley Horn," and it was published in Resonance, the Journal of Sound and Culture. Tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> So there's a, a program at Howard um, for junior faculty. It's mm -hmm. called the Junior uh, Faculty Writing and Creative Works mm -hmm. Program. And so they pair you up. Well, you have to apply for the program, and then you have to have <clears throat> some sort of project that you're working on finishing because mm -hmm. the idea is that when you get to the end of the program, you have a finished product that you can send out for, um, you can submit for consideration to be published. Mm -hmm. And so I applied for that program. That was, um, I think, uh, spring 2019. Mm -hmm. And my, uh, my mentor was actually, uh, she teaches at the law school at Howard. And so um, we worked together to like have focus me on one thing. I had so many ideas. I'm like, oh, I can write about this. I can write about mm -hmm. this. And, and she was like, but what are you really like? What's really, you know, pulling at you? And I was like, Shirley Horn. Because, you know, no one has written a book about her. She's um, she's from D.C. She's just this world-renowned um, person. And she could play piano and sing together like nobody, mm -hmm. you know, no one else could. And so... Um, yeah, I wrote an article basically looking at her influences, her um, her her piano, mm -hmm. the, her piano influences. So Errol Garner, mm -hmm. Rachmaninoff, um, wow. Ahmad Jamal, and how you know elements of their style translated to her style. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, is there a particular meaning to that title? Two heads are better than one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
uh, Johnny Mandel, I think it was Johnny Mandel, um, he tells a story about how he heard her on the radio. Mm-hmm. And he didn't know who it was, and he, you know, did some some research and and found out that it was Shirley Horn. And not only was she he cap he was captivated by her voice, but then he found out that she was playing for herself. Wow! And he was like, "Wow, I've never heard anyone be able to comp on the piano in a way that's totally separate from the way they're phrasing. It mm. sounds like two different wow. people. It's yeah. like she has." Two heads. Oh wow! You know, and so <laughs> I, I called it two heads. Wow, that's a great title. Like, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you have a website, kind of a black blog, where you share some things about your musical journey. It's called Between the Lines and Dots: Musings of Jazz Singing, <laughs> Composing, Arranging, Practicing, and Writing. What was the uh, inspiration for creating that website oh man so i um in 2012 i actually had left my position for a bit at howard Mm -hmm. um and my goal was to start well to be in 2012 mm -hmm. yeah you left howard at 2012 i left howard in 2012 for like a year and a half okay okay (laughs) and then i went back okay that's it um but the whole um idea was that I would be focusing more on just practicing, getting my stuff together, doing more gigs. Um, And one of the things I wanted to do was also to do some more writing. And so um, Brian and I had gone down to High Point, North Carolina, to see the John Coltrane house, because he Mm -hmm. grew up in High Point, Mm -hmm. and there was a statue. So Reggie Workman was in town, and um, we had gotten together with him, and he was talking about High Point, and Brian's like, we should go there. So we go there, and um, we had a great time. We went to the museum and the statue, and I wrote a blog post about it. And um, somehow the travel and tourism entity in uh, High Point found it and they were like can we this is great like can we put this on our website and i was like wow that's like pretty cool like i can do this and like i'll just write about what i'm practicing and performances i'm going to hear and things that are inspiring me and so the name comes from the poem by paul Lawrence dunbar when melindy sings which is a tune that abby lincoln Wow. Sings. What do you know about when Melinda sings? <laughs> Get away and but, put that noise, yeah. Miss Lucy. Put that music book away. So there's What's a, the use to keep on trying if, if you, you practice, practice till you're gray? gray? Yeah. You can't start no notes of flying. <laughs> like, like the, the one that, that rants and rings ring. yeah. from the kitchen to the big wood. Like when Melinda sings. Yeah. yeah. It's you beautiful. ain't got the natural <laughs> organs to make the song come right. You ain't got the turns of twisted. To make it sweet and light. Yeah. Isn't it so beautiful? Well, I, I, I did that. In, I did, uh, 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 it's, uh, easy enough for folks to holler looking at, at the, the lines, lines and, and dots. dots. When it ain't no one can sense it. And, and the, the tune, tune comes, comes in, in and spots. spots. Yeah. But for real, my Lord, Lord just music that just strikes your heart and cling. Mm-hmm. Just, just you listen. stand and listen with, with me. When, when Melinda, Melinda sings. Sing. <laughs> I did that in eighth grade as a poem. I did that poem in eighth grade. So when, when I saw it, I said, "Up, oh, come on now. You, this is what I'm saying. Everything is all right, pre-designed. So, <laughs> when will Lindy sing? Come yeah, on, but it's now. one of my favorite Abby Lincoln to, Like she sings that song. I mean, it's just you can see the whole. It's just so vivid, like the imagery, you know. And so my thing was looking at music, not just what's on the page, the lines and the dots, yeah. but what's between there is where yeah. the mu- the real music is. Wow. Yeah. So you're going to continue? Are you, you still? Yeah, I haven't pushing? updated it in a while, you know, because things have just been you so to, crazy. Your but writing my, is very nice. I mean, you're just, it's really like eclectic, like your your ideas. So yeah, keep keep doing that. Um, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's really like just your titles and then your writing is very um very it's very good so thank you so yeah you should be writing books and all that 
Seriously, <laughs> I'm not. Yeah. You know, I read. I read a little bit of the uh, Shirley Horn thing. I said, okay, she's she's she's, she's all right. I mean, you, <laughs> like a very professorial and and artist. Yeah. So continue to. Thank Do you. That. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Uh, writing for me has always been a very, um, yeah. you know, it's an outlet. Yeah. You know, much. And like I like singing. how you share your 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 story, like on that website and what you're doing. Yeah, continue to do that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it was a lot of fun when I was able to like really focus and and like update it regularly. Yeah. But I, my intention is to get back to, to yeah. doing that. And I always tell people, well, just continue to validate your ideas, and and like, and and keep it going. Because sometimes we'll do things, and then we'll stop, and then we'll because life happens. Mm -hmm. But just keep doing it because it really. You, you you might can't see the impact that it's having, but it's really impactful, you know. So, yeah. Thank you. Really yeah, and I'm inspired by you and then, you know, the stuff that you're doing with oh. your books and, and with this. And oh, thank just, you. And, you know, I just I started great. this. I, I, I just, I don't know why I'm doing this, but, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's become like a kind of a thing for me to learn, continue to learn about um, people who I thought I knew. And and it's and I get inspired, you know, hearing that story. So I said, okay, let me just do it again. It's so important yeah. how you're documenting. Yeah. Thank this. you. It's yeah. just it's phenomenal. Yes, yes, yes. All right, so we have to our final questions. Okay. All right. We talked about uh, future recording. You know, um, um, what's next? I know you talked about you uh, getting your doctorate. What else? Is there anything else that's next for Jessica Settles? Whew. Well, I'm not exactly sure. I just, at this point, I'm just thinking about finishing this doctorate. And then, well, I, I actually would like to um, figure out how to use my research um, and my ex experience so far mm -hmm. to help musicians kind of diversify, you know? Mm -hmm. So if there's someone who, um, you know, like me, has a lot of different interests, or not just mu music, mm -hmm. but writing and, you know, how how to help someone kind of formulate their ideas and, and figure out how they want to present them. So do they want to do a blog? And if so, you know, maybe help them set up a mm. template for that or um, they want to do a podcast or, yeah. you know, because I think people are, like you said, mu jazz musicians are so, yeah. <laughs> we're just so open-minded and we're into mm. a lot of different no sorts of things, but it's like, you know, these days you have to diversify your income streams mm -hmm. and figure out how you're gonna you know, how you're gonna work that. But there are things that we could be doing that can help to diversify, but you know, maybe someone may not know exactly what what kind of options there are out you there. You ever consider writing a book or, or writing books? So I have been approached about writing a book about Shirley Horn. <laughs> um, which- You know you're gonna have to talk to Warren Shad. You know Warren Shad, mm -hmm. that's his I Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when I gave my presentation on Shirley Horn as part of Amy's festival, Shirley's daughter, Rainey, Warren Shad, Shirley Horn's brother, mm -hmm. <laughs> Dale, and some other her family members were sitting in that audience. And you wow. talk about being nervous. I'm already nervous. Wow. Like my yeah. heart was in my throat. Wow. And so since then, like, I keep in touch with them. Mm -hmm. And um, I have, her daughter sent me, like, an ice bucket that belonged to Shirley. Really? Which I use. I break it out every wow. <laughs> during, you know, yeah, we yeah, have, yeah. like, little yeah. gatherings. I pull it out. I was yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but I, um, I, I think if I were to write a book, that that would probably be yeah. the first. You ever get one. to meet Shirley? No, yeah. I saw. I've seen her, you know, You've in seen concert. Her yeah, okay. But yeah. I never got to. I never got to mm -hmm. meet her. Wow. Okay. All right. 
here's our last question. Made it to the end. See, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> <laughs> and you can look right in the camera. How can people contact you if they want to learn about more of what you're doing, call you for a gig, <laughs> throw, send you some money? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, well, I'm on, um, you know, the social media uh, platforms, Facebook. I'm on there as Jessica Boykin Settles. Um, Instagram, JB Settles, I think. Okay. Um, my e can I give my email address? Sure. JB Settles One at Gmail dot com. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. Well, this has been fun. Oh, thank you so much. I was so honored. Oh, I was no, so this is, honored and this, happy to get the call. I can't even believe that I'm here. I'm so, no, this <laughs> so is excited. This, this is supposed to happen. Oh. I want to thank you, um, for sharing your some of your story. You know here on the conversation in jazz okay. and inspiring us and you're going to do some great things I, I oh, it, thank you. it's it's almost like just it's been lined up for you just walking there into your destiny so thank you continue to do uh, the great things you've been doing mm -hmm. and you know uh, continue to represent you know and uh, you. all the best to you so thank you and thank likewise you very much. Yes, thank you appreciate it all right so there it is the wonderful, the lovely Miss Jessica Boykin Settles <laughs> Thank you. here on the Conversation in Jazz. And we'll see you on the next one. I didn't know what time it was, then I met you. Oh, what a lovely time it was. How sublime it was, too. I didn't know what day it was You held my hand Warm like the month May it was And I'll say that it was Grand, grand To be alive, to be young To be mad, to be yours alone Grand to see your face Feel your touch, hear your voice Say I'm all your own I didn't know what year it was Life was no prize I needed love, there it was Shining out of your eyes I'm wise and I know what time it is Now